Hello and welcome to everybody. I'm so glad that you are here. Um, um, for a while now, the Susies have been talking about how do we deal with or how do we learn how to judge shows that are just not our thing? You know, uh, I'm not into vampires. If I go to a vampire show, how do I judge it sufficiently and effectively and fairly? And so we've talked about this for a long time and up pops Suhaila, who has um, wonderful training in this area. And so um, some of you might know Suhaila as an actor, a playwright, a doctor, an all around good person, a fabulous, you know, dramaturg, you might know her in various ways. But um, back in 2005, she was introduced to the Liz Lerman um, critique re response method and was so taken by it while she was working with um, Synchronicity that she decided that she needed to apply it to um, not only her own playwriting, but to help other playwrights, to help her students, to help other actors in terms of how do we give feedback when you go to that B movie that is all oh, by that, that whole movie was horrible, but the acting was good. How do you separate that? And this evening we will explore um, how, just how to do that. And Suhaila will walk us through that. So I am going to work on my internet connection. And meanwhile, I'm going to turn it over to the fabulous Suhaila to walk us through this. Thank you so much, Brenda. And Katie, I just wanna make sure I'm not gonna step on toes. I can go ahead and jump in for this. Great. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I know some of you are eating dinner, so we did ask if you wanted to turn on your cameras, you can. If you don't, because you're like, I chew with my mouth open and I'm comfortable with that, that's totally fine as well. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and, and we appreciate it if you don't turn on your camera. Um, so Brenda gave you a, a history of this. Celeste Miller introduced the critical response, the Liz Lerman critical response method uh, to us in 2005 when we did the Women in War project. And it was an essential thing that we needed in the development work, right? Because we had 18 women working, all artists, all working on this one project. And then we had to provide feedback to one another while still trying to move forward to get ready for a production. Um, and if that sounds like a nightmare to you, that would be a nightmare. Uh, Liz Lerman um, developed this method. How many are you, how many of you with a show of hands, if you want to use your, I can see it in the, in the chat, are familiar with the reference to the Liz Lerman method? I would love to, I would love to know that. It's got Kate over here. John, John, hi. Uh, Tony, I see you, um, Mary Lynn, and uh, Robin as well. Great. And Dory, I see you actually using your real hand. Um, so uh, to give you a history, Liz Lerman is a choreographer. They were doing a lot of uh, developing devised work in the, in the 70s and into the 80s. Again, artists' egos, brittle and huge and dominant, all in the same rooms, were trying to figure out how to develop this work uh, and, and be productive as they did it. And so she developed the critical response method. There's more than four steps to it, but I stay with these four main steps. And if you wanted to do more research, you can. Now I am talking about development process. And I'm sure you're thinking as, as individuals who are adjudicators or people who are gonna go out and um, evaluate art, how, if it's already up and it's running, how am I supposed to evaluate it with something that's for development process? So first of all, let's just go through the steps of the critical response method. Um, unfortunately, I have a PowerPoint for you. Ooh. I know, it's all fancy. Um, so uh, let's, let's go to this and uh, I'm gonna just walk you through it so you can see it written out. You guys can uh, see this. Everybody can see my critical response method right there. It's very fancy. Um, the first step that you work with, and we'll stay with development, but start to see if maybe you can figure out how it would work with productions. 
are moments that resonate. These are moments that are still with you at the as the play has ended. They're not complete thoughts. They're images, lines of dialogue. It can even be the title of the play. It can be a line. It can be, when it comes to productions, a moment of lighting that still haunts you. Maybe it's a bit of sound design that still haunts you, that's still with you. Um, and that's, that's where we start to go into how we can apply this to full productions. The important thing about moments that resonate is that it is not an opinionated moment, right? It's not a moment that you loved. It's not a moment that you hated. It's just a moment that is still with you. And that's why we say it resonates. And, and, and sometimes you have to ask yourself, why is this still with me? It's just something that's haunting me and it's with me. And, uh, and that's, that's where I am. Um, ooh, I think I skipped one. The next one is questions from the playwright, which of course we can't do, that's for development, but questions for the playwright. Now, these are questions that you would ask um, in regards to development for the playwright and the playwright is actually not supposed to answer them. Um, and, and these are supposed to be non-judgmental questions. As we're working with the idea of the playwright, what I would urge you to think about is using this as what you would ask the director and see if you can find the non-judgmental things that you can do about it. Like, um, it, it's not, why did you choose to do it this way? It is, what were you feeling when you did this? What do I think the director was thinking? Um, was that an actor choice or a director choice? Can I tell the difference? Was that something in the script or was that uh, an, an interpretation of the script? Can I see it? Can I see when people are working? Can I see when something is easy? That kind of stuff. Um, and again, it's just a guideline. And then we have permissioned opinions. And this is uh, the way I would ask you to apply it is, it is an opinion about the show. This is finally where you get to have your opinion. And it's important that it's not a suggestion. So in development, this makes sense, right? We've got an artist who's working hard and uh, they are trying to find their own voice. We don't need you pushing your opinion on them. Um, what we need you to do or your suggestion on them, we need you to just give them an opinion for the development of their work. So if you go and you see a production and you're sitting through it and you know at the end of it, you hate it, right? And you're like, this is just horrible. I, it's just horrible. You can't blanket do it. You can't, you have to ask yourself why. Now, if the first question is why, so like instead of questions from the playwright, it is now questions from the adjudicator to yourself. Why am I struggling with some of this stuff? What made me shut down? What will keep me open? Uh, what did I want? Why am I feeling this way? These are the questions that you can ask. And if you find the answers on the other side, you'll make your way to more constructive opinions. Um, I think about it in terms of if I went and saw, if I was alive when Shakespeare was alive and he had Romeo and Juliet, right? And I see, or I read his script and I see him and I say, hey man, I have an opinion about the end of your play. Would you like to hear it? And Shakespeare, for some reason says, yes. I say, God, I wish they would have gotten married right? That's a completely different play. So that's not going to help him. So I have to figure out why I feel that way. And I need to understand that that was a suggestion. And I need to know, okay, if I wanted them to get married, then what was I feeling? Maybe uh, it was uh, the ending was too sad. Uh, it took me out. I, oh, okay. I have an opinion about the end of your play. Would you like to hear it? Yes. I didn't like it. Can you be more specific? I didn't like it because it didn't feel real to me. It felt like it was too tragic. It felt like it was this. That's fine. So if you go and you see a show and there's a production and you can, you, you find yourself reacting to things, you really have to drop down into it. If you go and you see a play that has a lot of cursing in it and you are turned off by foul language, it sets something off in you in some form or fashion. Have to push past that filter and see if you can actually hear the story. And if you cannot hear it, then you have to ask yourself, why can't I hear it? Um, I would ask, uh, what am I hearing? Am I only hearing the cursing? Is that because 
it's the actor's portrayal of it. Are they emphasizing it too much? Was that the playwright's intent to emphasize it this much? Was there a way the director could have backed off of it in any kind of way? Is this the point? Is this not the point? Does it add something to it for me? Or did they make it gratuitous in the way they decided to produce it, right? There are plays that we have that, are, that have nudity in them. And sometimes the nudity can be gratuitous and sometimes it is helpful. If you can move past your discomfort and figure out what it is, using, using these moments in the critical response method, I believe can make you a stronger, smarter adjudicator and also just a smarter, stronger audience member so that you are not limited to your tastes, you are able to move past it and critically think. If you're not into romances and it's a rom-com, how are you gonna sit through it? And you can't pass it on to other adjudicators, must find a way to sit with it and go, okay, I, this is the stuff that usually shuts me down. I don't like musicals because I don't understand why people spontaneously burst into song. That doesn't make any sense to me. And it shuts me out, okay? Got it, you don't like it. Can you find something that you do like? What sticks out to you? What is still resonating? moving past your own personal tastes. Do we have any responses or questions so far? Mary Lynn. Thank you. Uh, this, this sounds fabulous. And it's, it sounds, it's a, a really good thing. I, I knew of it, but not it particularly. It sounds like it would be wonderful when I was taking playwriting classes and, and studying everything. For years though, we've been kind of well, we've been definitely told, you know, you're not judging the play, you're judging how it, you're judging the acting, you're judging the set, you're judging all the other stuff. And I have enough trouble with that concept. And I think that we're talking about, do, is it the playwright or is it the director? And the, um, I, so what I find helps me is just to sit down and write my opinion of the play. The play or the production? The well the play first to get that out of my hair just to get it get it said you know what is it about this play oh it's another neil simon oh ah, you know and that's over and then i then i move on and then i say now what did they do with it how did they how did they treat it what could it have gone this way or that way but it, it helps me to because of that we're not talking about the play itself right and that's been, been kind of the susie judge way so i just toss that out well, and I appreciate, it. and I think that there is a lot of that. This is still the same thing. This is still adding another step to, you're right. You, you, you get the thing that's distracting you. Like if you're sitting through a play, a production of a Neil Simon play, and the whole time you were driving to the theater and you're like, God, shit, I hate Neil Simon. I do, I do, I'm sorry. I'm... And then you, no, 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 it's really fine. And then you go and you get your drinks or your whatever and your concessions and the whole time you're like, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. And then you sit down and then the play starts play doesn't have a chance with you, right? They're gonna have to work that much harder to get to. Well, it does now because I know how to how to set that aside. But but I think, you know, that this technique want, it wants you to take all of those things into account and, and you really don't have, I do ask myself, why do you suppose they chose that play? Why you did the artistic- why the producers did and why the artistic directors? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and why yeah. did they choose that play now? And I try to keep in mind what their audience is, that they have they have an audience that likes Neil Simon, for example. And, you know, I like them to sort of be crazy and take their clothes off. I like monologue things. I like, you know, all who knows. So, um, yeah, I think you have to find a way to. You have you know, to, you're, you have to, I, I mean, it's the same thing as in developing a piece. You have to put your ego aside. It is ego that has these yeah. tastes and has these desires. But if you've committed to, um, if you've committed to wanting to participate in the voice of Atlanta's artistic evolution, and you want it to be something that is beneficial that helps move us forward, a lot of that is setting ourselves aside. And this is just another tool. It's not the only one, which is why Mary Lynn's idea is great. If nobody has done that before, if you've gone and you've seen a show and you know that you hate that kind of thing, if you can go home and then vomit onto the page or find a friend where you can be like, hey, Neil LeBute is horrible. He's a misogynist. I don't understand why anybody would ever do his work. It's just stupid, 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 stupid. But the lighting was great, right? Did And, and I have to tell you sometimes, um, 
sometimes I think about it in terms of there were, there's, there's been one play, one or two plays that I have taken as a director because I hated them. I hated the scripts, hated them. And all I could think was, I will find the production that I love of this script. And that is the way I will direct this without changing the intention of the playwright, without doing any of this, without doing any, like not, I, cause I can't, right? I have to understand the intention of the playwright but I got to the productions that I loved. And I think that you can do that as individuals who are evaluating art. So I was gonna, um, I was gonna move on. I was gonna test you guys with a short little script that I have put together with readings. But before I go on, I wanted to see if anybody else had any other comments or questions. Yes, Tony. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on. Yes, you're special and important. You're right here. You're all part of it. Okay. Um, so yeah, like Marilyn, I have done some crazy damn things when I know in advance that I'm going to some production I really don't want to go see. Um, you know, I, I helped uh, with Glass Menagerie in, in college and, and it was well done and, and it was just you know, it's just devastatingly depressing. So the last time I had to go to, I think it was GET to judge Glass Menagerie, God help me, I was dreading it. And so in my mind, I just wrote a third act where everything got changed and they all turned out okay. And I still have that story in my mind, you know, uh, but it allowed me to go see the show and be open to the first two acts. So, you know, Congratulations, you know, Marilyn, throw up on a page and then sit down and evaluate it. It only takes a couple of lines for me to get it out of my yeah. system, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, but it well, does, it does help it, it, yeah. because I feel like I have to say something. And, and I did say things about the play when I was, had just started judging, but then, you know, when they said it's not the play, you're not judging the play. So I that, mean, I think that, you know, when I, when I'm, when I'm teaching playwright residencies to high school students, a lot of them have not been exposed to theater. So one of my favorite things to do is once they've actually written their short scripts, I now need to help these students understand how to evaluate the script. And right. the first thing I ask them is the difference between, do they know the difference between a script and a production? Mm. And so it's really fascinating to, to, to know that because you can have a great script and a crappy production and you can have a crappy script and a fantastic production. Yep. And the question is, when you are evaluating that, how, how do you do that? Like if something is absolute eye candy and it's beautiful and it's well done, but the script had no substance, what, what do you, where do you go? And, and, and that's why I think the moments that resonate idea will help you. If you stay mm -hmm. with the things that are still with you, those are the things that you go out with and evaluate. If the sound comes with you, then that's the thing that you can look at. And maybe that might end up being a nomination, right? If the lighting comes with you, if the costumes come with you, if any of that comes with you, that's where it is. So um, I, I use this small little script. I usually have students read it, but I, I uh, was able to get some friends to help me out really quick this afternoon and uh, put this together put it together with as many production elements as I could. And I, I want you to evaluate what you want to evaluate. And we're going to try to do this, right? So uh, let's jump in. I'm going to share the screen again. In Control by Suhaila Alatar. Lights up to reveal a park in the middle of a big city, maybe. A single bench sits empty on a sunny day. Birds can be heard singing in the background. If it weren't real, it'd be a cartoon. Maybe. Sam enters, sits on bench, seems a bit anxious. Just as Sam is about to pull something from his jacket pocket, Marty enters. From the opposite direction, seems preoccupied with her own thoughts and proceeds to sit on the bench on top of Sam and then jumps up. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Obviously. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? I said it's a beautiful day. I heard it? you the first time. Well, you didn't respond, so naturally I thought. I wish you wouldn't. Are you okay? Do I seem okay to you? 
You just sat on me and then you ask if I'm okay. I mean, that really takes the cake. Have you ever had someone almost sit on you? A perfect stranger, I mean. I mean, really. Well, then. Marty sits on the far end of the bench, away from Sam. A moment passes. There are other benches in this park, you know. Wow. Yep. Well, then. Marty exits. Sam watches to make sure Marty is completely gone. Then... Finally. Sam pulls out the remote control from pocket, hits a button, the birds stop singing, hits another button, the lightning changes into a cloudy day and storm clouds sound like it's moving in. Sam presses another button one more time, but nothing happens. Sam hits the remote the way we all do and we think the batteries need to be jostled a bit. That's when Marty re-enters. Sam realizes Marty is back. They stare at each other for a beat. Well then. Mm -hmm. Blackout and a play. All right. So let's go with moments that resonate. Let's practice this out. These are moments that just stick with you. They're not necessarily positive or negative. There's another bench in the park. Boy, did that stick out. Okay. Moments that resonate. Anybody else? Or sitting on him. For sitting on him. Also, don't fight too hard. If there's no moment that resonates, take that into account as well. Pulling out the remote. Sorry? Pulling oh. out the remote. Pulling out the remote. Lisa, I see that your hand is up. Um, I was also going to say the moment that she sat on him kind of resonated with me, but overall, it was just kind of even keel for me. Okay. Great. Margaret? Pulling out the remote and realizing that it turned off the birds. Julie? Oh. The anger between the two characters. Great. What? All right. So- The lighting. The, the, the whole, lighting. The lightning. The, no, the lighting, the yeah. Thing. The light, you mean the lightning coming on from- No, the lighting. Thing. The light The light coming down. The fact that it started getting dark for him and then it started out being very bright. She says it's a lovely day. And then he plays with his remote and the birds go down, but also the light went down too. I am fascinated by this because you, you do you mean technically you saw the yes. light? Wow, that's fascinating. Okay, um, all right. So then what are questions that popped up for you in watching this? Uh, hush. Why did the remote stop working? Okay, so that's in the story. So this is interesting, okay. Because she's coming back. Who is he that he has that control? That he controls the remote. Okay, so you're asking yourself questions about the story. What yeah. does that tell you in regards to what you were watching? We're engaged. You're engaged. That's a good, that's a good sign. Any questions that came up for you? Like, I, I, if I had been watching this, questions that would have come up for me were, Technically, yeah, I know we're all kind of limited on Zoom. Um, what's with the two different pictures of the park? Am I supposed to just accept that's the same park? Why, why the, the color's not the same? It's not even the same season. That doesn't seem to be consistent. How were the sound levels? That's something that I would have focused on. How are the performances? Now, what's interesting to me though, is that if you were engaged, that means the performances didn't get in the way. And that's something to pay attention to. The directing didn't get in the way. Um, that's, that's another thing to take in as a layer. Any other questions that popped up for you? One observation I had was, I thought when- Wait, hold on, is it a question or an observation? Good question. Let me give you, give me the observation. Let me hear it. I asked myself, I, what I noticed at the top was the sound, I felt the sound was too loud. But then once it evolved and he turned it off, 
I, it answered the question for me. So how would I break that down is it, in is, critical response process? Well, I mean, I think for me, if, 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 if that was something that stuck out to me, I'd be like, if you're in the beginning and you're like, God, this sound is really bad, it's distorted, but then something happens in the story within the production and it suddenly clears something up for you, then yes. that is smart sound design or maybe that's smart directing and smart creative team that put that together or they got lucky. You know, here's, here's the other part that's really hard for a lot of us. We are a small community. So a lot of times also we will walk into a production and we will know every actor on that stage and we will know all the people that are behind the scenes and we will know all the, all of the, sometimes we'll know all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes while the production was getting ready. Don't kid yourself if you don't think that affects you when you're watching the show. There's got to be a way. And to me, asking questions of yourself of, did I shut down here because so-and-so was playing the role or did I shut down here because it wasn't actually well executed? Is there a possibility that this person that I do not like is actually doing a good job in this? Is it possible that this theater that normally does crap work is actually doing a good job on this or did they get lucky? This sound designer is usually incompetent. Did they get lucky or did they do it on purpose? You know, those, those are the things to keep you on your toes. And I will say, it's all very technical. This is a tool to use for yourself when you might not be able to get engaged. But if you go to a show and you find yourself engaged, take note of that. That's, that's gonna speak everything to you. If there was nothing that distracted you from it, then there's something strong in that production, you know? The other useful tool in all of this for me is you, there are evaluations of uh, world premieres. There is something that you can go into with these world premieres and ask yourself, was this show ready to go up? Was, do I think that they, do, do, do I see that it was premature? Do I, how do I feel about that? How would I know? What do I know of the workshop process? I don't think what you guys do is easy. I think letting your ego come in and help guide you is easy. I think doing it smartly and with critical thought is an extremely difficult responsibility and job. And, it, and, and it's a lot to hold on to, but I can believe, I believe it can be done. Yes, Kate. Question. So you asked for observations, you asked, for, and I sort of just came out with what I, but here's what I thought and here's what I, how would you take critical response process and reframe what I said? Well, I, it's not that we even need to. Um, that's the thing, especially for evaluation. I mean, if we were, if we were doing development work, and I was with a playwright and I needed to protect my playwright in some kind of way, I would, I would have the response to you. But, and I would ask you to reword and make sure that you put it in the form of a question so that your brain can transfer that into a question, which makes you smarter as an audience member, right? So it makes you have more critical thought. Um, and then if we moved into permissioned opinions about the production, um, you know, uh, it's interesting. There was a there was a production done a couple of years ago, and I was friends with the lighting designer. Uh, the lighting designer was so proud of their work, so proud. And I heard multiple times how uninteresting it was. And I would ask people; these are not even uh, adjudicators. I would just ask people up front, "Why? How did you notice the lighting? How did you notice it?" Mm -hmm. How did you notice unremarkable lighting? And the response was be because it wasn't remarkable because there were moments that you were craving an emotion to happen, but the lighting blocked, the choice of the lighting design blocked that emotion from coming to you. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the things to pay attention to. It, it's, it, it really breaks it down into technical, technical, technical moments. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, I say, sometimes you'll walk in and you just fall in love and you, you, you stay for the ride and you go all the way through. And then that is something for you to take into account. 
I will also say, if you really love certain actors and performers and playwrights and certain theaters, perhaps wear a tougher garment, a visor when you walk in and make sure that you are seeing it in the light that it really is instead of the rose colored glasses that you like to see it in at all times. Um, at, check in with yourself by using this method. Are you, do you have favorites? Why do you have those favorites? Are you being fair? And what does fair mean to you in regards to that evaluation? It's a lot, I think mostly for you, the critical response method is a lot of questions. It's the moments that resonate and a lot of questions. And then you can go into the opinions and then figure out why you have those opinions. I, I, I'm not a lighting designer. I can just tell you that I didn't feel something that I felt like I should have. I'm not a sound designer but I can tell that they repeated the birds. Has anyone ever done that one? You're watching a park scene and you can hear the loop of the birds in the background because it's the same rhythm over and over. That's a bad sound designer. That's the stuff that I think you should look into and pay attention to. Does that seem fair? Well, okay. it, it really depends on the show because that loop of birds might be intentional. Absolutely. So really, you, you coming out with that right there just disproves your whole point. Oh, it doesn't disprove my point. It, 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 everything has to be in context, obviously. Everything's right, but to, but to go in and say that's a bad light, that's a bad sound designer, which, you know, I think it brings to the point that we go in expecting something or things that we think are not good might actually be good based on the circumstance. So that open broad statement that you made to me was, was very inconsistent with what we're trying to do. Oh, so then let me rephrase. That was my interpretation of, of what you would just say. And let me rephrase. If I walked in and there's a show and, and I'm looking at a park scene, <clears throat> that is obviously not working within a context where the looping of the birds is beneficial to the story or seems to be connected, but I can hear the looping. That to me would be poor sound design. However, if I'm watching a show and there seems to be a surreal magical element to it, or if maybe there's a character that's going through some psych psychological effect, or if the director and the sound designer create an emotional intention with that kind of looping and I feel it, then it's great sound design. But everything is within context. And it takes a con, it is a constant connection to the art that you are watching. Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, what about if you know that you're gonna go see a script that you love and then you go and the production is boring. So you can't even stay engaged the whole time. You know, the script is good because you've enjoyed it in other places, you've read it. You have enjoyed it that way. What happened here? But I appreciate that. So absolutely call me on that because you're right. I can't make a blanket. I can't make any blanket statements. Nothing works black and white here. And I think that's the hardest part of this. This is constantly keeping your abs in check, right? You're like staying in this core thing the whole time. Um, yes, Tony. Um, a couple of experiences that I've had. And um, for example, go into Shakespeare's Tavern. Um, I, I think there are times when we need to do a little prep work as judges um, in order to be able to actually sit back and then just enjoy the production as opposed to feeling challenged by it. And the two examples that come to mind, um, Shakespeare's Tavern, I usually try, at this point I've seen a lot, so many shows that I'm familiar with most of the plots, but when I first started I would, I would read the synopsis before I went so that I could more easily enjoy the production rather than searching for the meaning of every line. And then, um, you know, if you know that you're going to a play that the subject matter is something that you're uh, unfamiliar with because of, you know, who you are in life or how you've grown up or what you've been taught or, uh, or because of um, any number of reasons, try to familiarize yourself with before you go. We had a, a show I'm trying to remember the name of it. But anyway, there was a lot of history in this show that had to do with uh, King Cotton 
And I thought it was an outstanding show, but it did not get recommended. And um, I think largely in part because a lot of that information made references to other things that made references to other things. And it was a very highly layered show. And without a complete um, or at least partial understanding of the history, just like a partial understanding of some of the meaning with Shakespeare's language, part of that show and its value was lost by on some of the judges. And, and I think that's why it didn't get recommended. That's solely and completely and absolutely positively nothing but my opinion. <laughs> so, but if you're going to a show where you know that you have uh, a deficit in terms of general background or general knowledge, I would encourage everyone to do a little research so that when they get there, that they're in a, a better comfort zone. I mean, and in doing that, what's interesting is that you become a, um, a different kind of audience member. And, and what you're speaking to is that, that's something that I, I, I wonder about now is that as evaluators in what you're doing, you, you are, you're a supercharged audience member because if it's the layman that's coming off the street, are you looking at the production through those eyes or are you looking at it through the eyes of artistry and, um, and what you think should be, you know, what you're, what you're feeling with the training that you have? I saw a hand go up, Mary Lynn. Yeah, I, I always read the program for heaven's sake. I read the director's notes. I read whatever they're saying about it. And and I really feel like, you know, if, if I somebody's trying to talk to me beforehand, I'll say, listen, I got to read the program before I start because that's part of it. It's part of the show. And sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, especially smaller theaters or new theaters will say, we didn't have time to get a program together. <laughs> well, okie dokie. <laughs> I'll get, <clears throat> that's a mark for you. Uh, so I think that that, that helps. Yes, ma'am. Brenda, I saw your hand go up. I've got two comments. Um, one in terms of um, Tony and Mary, Mary Lynn. Uh, one thing that Rich Vitaris always would do is if he was going to a show, he would order the script and read it. So he would know what was script and what was production, which I was like, wow. That's, I mean, I thought that was amazing. I don't know if everybody has time to do that or the, or, or the, you know, the ability to do that, but he would always um, do that. So that's just a thought if you want to. But my other, I wanted to piggyback on Tony for a minute because there have been times, according to what I hear you saying to Hila, is if you're asking yourself, does it serve the purpose of the production or the purpose of the play? Um, in terms of whether it's good lighting, good sound, good whatever. Does it serve the purpose? And then I go to Tony's thing. That there have been some shows that I've walked away and gone, what in the world was that about? I, I, so I don't know if it served the purpose of it because I have no freaking- but, but, then, but then you have, within that, you have your answer, right? If, if, if the whole idea of the, is, to, is for us to perform stories, so that the stories reach other people and that you understand the story as an audience and you get something from it. Instead, you walk away and you're like, I don't know what I just watched. Then it means to me that something got in the way, the acting, directing, lighting, costumes, everything, something got in the way. One of my favorite things to, I, I will never forget a years ago, 20 years ago, God, I'm so old. 20 years ago, a friend of mine went to go see a show and I, and I think it was at Actors Express. And the next day I saw her and I said, how was the show? And she said, I, I wish I was watching the play that this person was in and not the play that everybody else was in. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because that means there's no unification between the directing, right? If you've got one actor that's performing a completely different tone and it doesn't seem that's what the intention is and you can feel that dissonance that's again, yeah, it's if you're not under and, and it makes you not understand what's happening. That's something to take into consideration. Um, Margaret had her hand up and then I'd love to make a comment after Margaret. Please, Margaret. I lowered mine because it, it related to the fact that Rich would buy the scripts and read them. But for those of us on the musicals panel, if at all possible, we try to listen to the original cast recordings. So then we have I mean, something. I 
how do you do that? Well, when you compare, how do you do that and not, you know, it's sort of like Laurence Olivier's Hamlet versus Chris Kayser's. Do you know what I mean? Like, how do you not? It's more of an opportunity to have some idea of what's supposed to be coming up, even if it's a different take on it. Obviously, it would be a different take on it with a different actor, but part of the preparation for it. Yeah, the human filter and factor of, of, of you being human, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll say, that's a lot. Uh, Kate, you were going to say yeah. something. Yeah, this, was, this is a, a philosophical uh, musing comment. Um, because I, I just truly appreciate the whole concept of, you know, we're always going to keep the the best way for any any of us to keep getting better at whatever it is we do, is to keep practicing, keep asking questions, keep exploring. And so part of why I love this process that Liz Lerman developed was, it it, it was a great script for asking oneself questions. How do I to get to the idea of I think I'm being fair and rational, but what don't I know? What am I not aware of? And, and that just seems like such an important process to go through in any sort of adjudication situation. But I got to see Liz Lerman speak um, at a TCG conference 20 years ago. Uh, and what I took away from her process and the thing that struck me was we've got so many judges who've seen so many plays and have this deep repository of Atlanta theater knowledge history opinions and how do you give I think that we have folks who have so much knowledge and the deep desire to help the deep desire to want to support the artists, the deep desire to want to help support the theaters that are producing, that giving critical feedback is assumed as a way to be helpful. You're wanting the play to be better. You're wanting the script to be better. You're wanting the production to improve. And so here we have this, this huge collection of knowledge how do they give feedback in a way that is fair? But it's kind of, so is this making any sense at all? It is. I think that you're asking me the question of, which is what I was saying earlier, if, if, if we've had so much knowledge of so many things and all of that goes in with us every time we go to watch a show, how are we supposed to take all of that off and watch what's in front of us? Is that what you're asking? Yes. And? And let me just add that the thing that blew my mind when I saw Liz demonstrate this, because of course Liz is a choreographer and a dancer. And so she physically sort of demonstrated changing the idea of feedback from, and Suhaila, you will tell me if you disagree with this, but she was, a, she was about explaining the difference between giving feedback in a hierarchy on a vertical, yeah. I'm, I'm the judge mm -hmm. and you're the artist mm -hmm. and I'm telling you. That's ego, yes, yeah. And she was trying to say, what if we're all equal? Mm -hmm. What if we all exist in this horizontal <laughs> plane? You have to want the feedback in order for me to give it to you. So it, she she did this, uh, I will not dance for you, I'm sorry, oh. but I know. But she did this lovely sort of movement piece to express her point of if we're all, how do we truly help each other and give critical feedback and receive critical feedback, but in a way that takes the hierarchy out of it. I mean, and that's, and that's exactly it. I mean, the dissonance between the artistic community here in Atlanta and, and the evaluators, I don't wanna call you judges, right? Cause that, that does seem to kind of give uh, a, a sense of hierarchy is, is the feeling that there have been individuals that are part of your group that almost behave in a, in a the only way to put it is a stereotypical Yelp reviewer kind of way 
I am a, I'm an adjudicator. And that immediately sets a different uh, relationship. And, and so there is something to the idea of not, not being set, you can't separate yourself, um, but you can be beside people and finding a way to evaluate from that position rather than from on high. And, and it's not easy. I'm not, I'm not gonna say it's easy. I wanna say one thing, Tony, before I go, I'm not go, but before I, I, I let you speak, one of the things that this is bringing up for me is um, I, I did a I did a one woman show. I'm going to come to you guys from the point of an actor and a writer. This is this is what I'm what I'm doing for this. Um, I was doing a one woman show again 20 years ago here in Atlanta, and uh, the director said to me after my first night off book, and I'm I did my thing. The director said to me as my note for the night. So Hila, if you get done with this show and you walk out in the lobby and everybody comes up to you and tells you how great you were, then you failed at doing your job. But if you get done with the show and you walk out into the lobby and people come up to you and say, you made me think about this, then you did your, your job correctly. And again, it's all about ego being put aside, not making it about you and making it about the story and making it about the production to keep you balanced. Um, and, I, and I think find a way to reroute the thoughts sometimes to get that grounding. So for some, it might be a whole new muscle. For most of you, it'll be like coming home. And for others, it will be like, I, I'd like to give it a try. Um, Tony, what was your comment? I, I'd like to hear what you think about this and uh, anyone else that wants to chime in. What do you think about us referring to ourselves as evaluators as opposed to judges in the CV. I don't have an opinion. I'm out. <laughs> Not it. <laughs> okay. Yes, Mary Lynn. I don't have an opinion on that either, but but I do think it helps a lot for us to have the the round tables so that we can ask a choreographer what makes good choreography we can ask the musical judges what what makes a good music how does it work and and you can learn from each other so much and it's it makes the the group more cohesive and makes you want to to see your buddies some more you know because you really don't see each other all that much but to learn together i think is is a really valuable thing and you learn you learn tips like, you know, playwright tips, th things like oh, this, this production didn't hold together. And I always think back to whose play is it? Whose play is it? Can I tell whose play it is? And did I get it right? Did I get off on a tangent somewhere? Uh, so those are little things that you learn from each other when you, you sit down and, and talk about things. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. Yes, Stephen. Um, there were two things in this city that really separate a lot of the theaters. The first one is sound and sound quality or their lack of. You can go see a show and someone is sitting in one place and a Susie Judge is sitting in another place. And they, you know, so then how do you, who are sitting someplace that you can't hear at all, judge it the same way as somebody who doesn't well, and then go ahead i have such a strong response to that i think it's the director's responsibility like they should be on time you know what the house is that you're in and and right. if you, in your mind as a director I, I it always makes me really upset when i hear a director go well those are the bad seats so i'm not no no <laughs> no your responsibility is to make sure that everybody in that house hears and if you as an audience member feel isolated because you weren't able to afford the seat that was over there, that's not that's not the way we're supposed to tell stories. Sorry, very well, I, I, that's talk. okay. No, I, I, I totally agree with that. But then a lot of that also has to do with, you know, funding and how much a theater has and how do you judge yeah. scenery at the Alliance versus scenery? And it's the same sort of. This is a great question. This is a fantastic question. And, and I have to tell you, you don't compare the theaters. Correct. 
Correct. You can't, you can't, you can't go to, uh, I can't even think of small theaters now anymore that I, I, I feel like every theater is trying, you know, I, and, and you can't go to a, 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 a Horizon Theater show and expect the special effects that you get at the Alliance Theater. If, what would be fascinating, really, is if all the theaters did one show, just <laughs> one show, right? And, and, and it became sort of like Christmas pageant. Everybody, and everybody actually does it at Christmas. Mm -hmm. We all see a Christmas carol in every possible way it can be interpreted, right? Um, but, but when you walk in, you know that you're gonna go see the Aurora Theater's Christmas Carol versus the Alliance Theater's Christmas Carol. And we're ready to separate them. So you, you just don't, you, you walk in and it's not, is this good enough, right? Because you don't wanna short sell the theater that you're going to. You wanna walk in and see that effort is put forth. And that is what you're looking for. But that's, that's not even about funding. Do you, the resilience of theater individuals and artists that is like a MacGyver-esque kind of spirit of like, I have bubble gum and a rubber band. I can make a trap door somehow or moving past what a script is calling for and finding a far more creative solution instead of trying to impersonate another theater production. That is quality. That is creativity. And that is artistry that can be rewarded. And I, and, I, and I hesitate to even say rewarded, acknowledge, acknowledge, right? Because we're not saying anyone's better than anyone else. Recognize. We're, we're, we're saying that we're recognizing the productions. This production is being recognized because, because I, I was not distracted the whole time I was there. But you have to let go of your other theater. You know, if you think about it, oof, I haven't been raunchy this entire time. So now you're gonna get raunchy. If you think about it in terms of uh, if you had multiple lovers, right? You have a polyamorous relationship with people across Atlanta. You don't compare them. You go to them for a certain satisfaction for what they give you. And sometimes they're a little bit better than they were before. A little bit stronger. They push themselves to the next limit. There you go. Okay, so I've got something for you though. I mean, I've got, I wanna go back, Suhaila, to the sound. These two seats in this theater yes. just have, the sound sucks in those two seats. That is a technical thing. And there's, I don't know too much what a director can do. And maybe I'm a you, bad director. You go, you go to the artistic director and go, don't sell these seats. Oh, okay. So you're not saying that the art, okay. That that can be done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. You go I'm and you like, say, we how have... can you make those two what what put and I, and I know I can figure it out. <laughs> and there's there's such a there's still even with um even as we evolve and we keep evolving in our theater productions, there's still this kind of uh very um um homey kind of feel to our community that if 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 the show is selling well and those two seats are available right? And everything else is sold out. I have watched box office people go, I mean, there are two seats. <laughs> it sounds not good. And people go, no, I want them anyway. Okay. There's a seat, but it's behind a pillar. You'll have to lean. Totally worth it. I just want to be in the room. Okay. But you're, they're your last resort seat. Got you. That I'm, I'm with you on. I was trying to figure out how you're going to make those seats where you could hear. I was like, hmm, you put extra speakers there. I'm trying to figure it out. I was like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and here's the other part is, is that you, you know, I think the other distinction is that you're evaluators, you're not theater critics, right? Evaluators. And so that's why it's not comparing. It's evaluating what's being presented to you in the moment. Um, and, and you know, and, yes, yes. And yes. critics do talk about the play. Critics are there for the play. And the only time you can really talk about the play is if it's a world premiere. I mean, those were the old rules. I don't know what's gonna happen now, but that was those were the guidelines for the for us. In, and in the, what dawned me was that there was a world premiere here in Atlanta a couple of years ago that 
I, 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 I thought I saw it and I, and I thought what I was seeing was worthy and it wasn't recommended. And I remember I asked somebody why it wasn't recommended. And the response was, there's a lot of foul language in it. Are you, uh, hmm. are huh. you kidding? That is the reason? That's not a good reason. I'm surprised because we've, we've been told about that for years. Well, people you were don't like the language. Well, fuck no, get over it. You know, that's what they tell us. <laughs> so <laughs> Mary Lynn and I are now going out for drinks. We're yeah, it's <laughs> the, the gloves are off now. But. All right. Okay. Yes. Uh, question, question for actually both Mary Lynn and Suhaila. The, it, well, and anyone else who wants to weigh in, because this goes back to uh, Mary Lynn, what you were talking about a little bit ago, and that was how useful the round tables can be. Mm -hmm. So if someone, would it be useful? Do you feel like there's enough conversation that has happened? I think I'm answering my own question. Um, the difference between design and budget or concept and budget. Do we feel like there needs to be more conversation specifically around that? No, I don't. I mean, I, I, I you have what you have. It's what you do with it. But we had we had casting directors come and talk to us once, mm -hmm. which I thought was really helpful. You know, how do you who's available? How, how do you decide how you know? And we would get people from two or three different theaters to talk about these things. And, and those are, those are good decisions. You know, I mean, I, I tend to blame if something's wrong, I blame the director. I don't know that everybody does, but I always just say, well, that was a bad choice. They could have done better with that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, th okay. I won't talk anymore, but that's, I do think that's a, an important thing to have the, the round tables. So we learn from each other about how to judge these things. And learn from your artists currently that are running through the, the community. Margaret, I see that your hand is up and there's a second hand. Brittany, I see you as well. So you'll go after Margaret. I wanted to go back to the discussion of the seats that have bad sound or obstructed view or things like that. The other thing we've always been trained as, as Susie people is you take the seat you are given. And unfortunately, sometimes I think the theaters don't necessarily take into account that some seats are better than others. And of course they want to sell their best seats, but unfortunately sometimes that puts the Susie person in a not as good seat. And we can only judge what we see. We can only evaluate. I always move after the intermission. If there's, <laughs> if I spot an empty seat, I go. Well, that's probably not really reflecting well on the show if there are empty seats that suddenly open up. Um, I, I, I will say, but Margaret, that's still an evaluation of the directing, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. it's possibly an evaluation of the producers. And that's something to take into account as well. Um, and and Brittany, uh, you you had a comment or a question. Hi, hi everyone. I've been listening. Um, this is great. Thank you, Suhaila. I have um, never been a judge. I'm a new Susie board member, and so this has just been so enlightening. I'm gonna try to ask this question as clear as I can. Um, Last year or the year before last, I think Ride the Cyclone won Best Musical. Is that correct? Is that right? Does anybody know? Yes, okay. we're all nodding yes. our heads. I don't know if yes. you know. Oh, great, sorry. You won everything. Sorry. I, am, I am baby, I am baby uh, bottle making, apologies. No um, and that show had come to Atlanta with, um, with a cast from out of town and with um, setup that had already been done in different theaters. How does the Susie's take that into account, speaking against, uh, speaking about the budgets and the setups, th this show has had such a, um, so much more put into it than these other shows that just went up once at say Horizon. How does that, get compared how does that not get skewed in the judge's mind because to maybe an outsider it might look like oh well the alliance shouldn't count i'm not saying this is my opinion i'm saying the alliance shouldn't be able to go for any susies because they have you know so much bigger budget than everybody else and they're bringing shows from out of town like how do you keep that in mind 
you know, I'm, did that? Yes, no, that make any it sense? made absolute sense. My first question would be, what okay. was the awareness of the evaluators in regards to the show? Were they aware that it was mm -hmm. basically a traveling show? Mm. And you can get online and go look at reviews and go look at pictures, which is why I, how I found that it, they were using the same set for uh, August Wilson's How I Learned to, not How I Learned to Drive, How I Learned something, but it was the same back that, that, that True Colors used was the same set that somebody else had. And they, they, we asked them and they said, oh yes, that was developed together. It was developed as a, it didn't say it in the program, but then they, they admitted that it, well, it had to, because it was the same set. Uh, so yeah, you, you can be a detective about some of this. I often go look and see how it's been mounted by other theaters. Uh, and don't forget, we gave the trestle at Popelick Tr Creek one set design, as did K K2. Both of those were by that crazy little fly-by-night place that 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 theater company, but they did a great job. So yeah, we we're capable <laughs> of right, breaking so, that. To stay focused on Brittany's comment and question. Yeah, yeah. How to how do you how how do you allow to given you here? How would you approach a show like that at the Alliance? And I guess the question I go back to again is were the adjudicators, were the evaluators aware of what this show was when they went and saw it? And it will say that the judging committee was a, was aware. The judging, um, okay. These are discussions that the previous judging committee would have often um, mm -hmm. because, you know, touring shows, traveling shows are not part of what the Susie's judge. Right. So there should have been, I assume had been, enough difference in that production of Ride the Cyclone in particular, that it wasn't just a rental. It wasn't just a touring show. Yes, it was a whole lot of people from out of town. And that's also a topic that comes up for discussion a lot is how much do the Susies need to be focused on recognizing Atlanta-based artists versus people who come in from out of town. Because the Alliance gets a lot of their folks from out of town, but not all of them. And there are other theaters who get some folks from out of town. So there has have been discussions over the years of do the Susies only recognize Atlanta artists or are we recognizing Atlanta theater, mm -hmm. Wh wherever uh, the creators might come from? Yeah. Uh, again, I, I'm not part of this. So that is definitely, see, these are great questions. And these are the so, questions that you ask yourself to, to understand what your goal is in evaluating Atlanta artistry. Um, these are discussions that go on and on and on. They do, and and right and rightly so. I think it's it's you know as you're trying to find your absolute identity as an evaluator, I, I think the question will keep be kept being asked until you feel better, not until you've settled, until you feel like you're actually doing the thing. Tony, you had a question or a comment? Uh, I just wanted to build off of what Margaret was saying. Yeah, the judging committee and the Susie Board of Directors and everyone has dealt with these questions and tried to find that, you know, that place of where we we evaluate what we figure is our uh, priority. To give you an example, um, if we know, and we can normally find out, uh, if we know that a set has been purchased, then that set doesn't get evaluated for the purposes of set design. If we know that all of the costumes were purchased, then the costumes do not get evaluated for the purpose of costume design. Why? Rented. It's not rented. an element. It, 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 rented. Rented. Yeah. rented costumes, yeah. Right, exactly. So it's not an element that takes away from the overall production or uh, adds to the overall production. It's an element that is not evaluated. That's part of how it's been handled in the past. Now, and, and there have been times when bizarre things have happened where, you know, where we think that we have an orchestra and we don't. So, you know, <laughs> oh. there are situations that are a little more delicate than others. And there's some that are obvious, 
but yes, this is the work that we deal with every single day. So this is, and this is, so there are things that, the, the, the word that stuck out in my head that you said that is resonating with me is that you said, if we find out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Why is, why is it not part of the response for evaluators that all of that is part of the footwork for every production. It sounds like a lot of work, but it's, is that a possibility? For it's happening. Okay. Um, so for the past two years, we've asked for this information ahead of time. Great, great. And so, yeah, great. So we know if it's a rented set, we know if it's rented costumes, we know whether the cast is being considered as leading and supporting people or whether it's an ensemble. We know that going into it. So in answer to your question about, are we evaluating Atlanta theater or are we evaluating Atlanta artists? I, I guess my response, I, I have a response to that. Would you like to hear it? Sure. Yeah. sure. You can say no. Yes. Um, yeah. Steven's like, I see what you did. Um, <laughs> What is the mission of the Susies? Right. To recognize Atlanta theater. Professional. Profe theater. Yeah, professional Atlanta theater participants. So uh, as we are doing this critical response and we, we turn it onto ourselves, right? The story of the Susies is summed up by its mission. So when you don't know where you're going, you ask yourself how you feel about that mission. And if this is adhering to the evaluation, here's the new one for you too. As the Susies are going into new work, a new question that you, I, I suggest strongly that you take with you is about racial equity casting in these productions. Because if part of the Susie mission is being a part of the, uh, the evolution of Atlanta artistry. Part of that will be having to break really bad habits that people were not aware that they were doing. Not all of them, right? And that ha that's gonna be a thing that I, I don't, I I'm, this is just me saying to me, that's another question I would put in for the critical response that you have to productions. You can speak with it with your committee and speak with it with your members. Mm -hmm. I feel it, that's going to be a huge part of your story going forward. Am I incorrect in that? You are. Correct. It's it's in process. Yeah. It's in process. Yeah. Many many hours of of work and discussion are are going into it. I did that. That's great. That's yeah. great. Um, I still see a hand up. It's, oh, it's just Margaret. It's just Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> um, Margaret's just sitting there like that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are nearing the end. Um, I, Kate, do you want to take over? Or does anybody else have any questions or comments for me? I really hope that you understood what I was hoping to communicate here. Um, and Dude, that Madam, it, can, I, can I chime in with one thought from all of this? Is it going to hurt my feelings? Gosh, I hope not. Okay, then you can There's say. There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> Lila, you can say no. There's a lot of crying on stage, but hopefully that's not where we're going. To. Only when it's really bad acting. No, I'm, <laughs> go ahead. Um, just sort of um, the critical response method and which is obviously intended to help people develop work and we're trying to use the tools to help us be better audience members. Um, one of the one of the things I, I I see a lot of this conversation going like how do you evaluate how you know how do you compare things? I just have a, a thought about it all that one of the reasons you want a diverse set of judges one of the reasons we don't spend send one judge to each show to make a evaluation and we send 15, 20, you know sometimes more judges to a show is because we are all going to have somewhat personal responses to any piece of art. And that there is no right answer to which play had the best acting and to which play had the best this, that, or the other, right? I mean, we are all going to have opinions on that. And so what I like about the critical response method as not being a judge myself, just as a you know, active audience member, 
is that it requires me to ask what was the intention? What were they working with? How creative were they with what they were working with? How much did it make me feel something, even if it was something I really didn't like feeling? Um, and so I just wanna pull back from the beginning of this. I mean, I think we very helpfully because a lot of people on this call actively grapple with these like really concrete questions about how the Susie judges are supposed to evaluate disparate things. But I really wanna come back to what I thought was valuable about what I learned tonight. And that was that tool of sort of asking, 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 what were they going for? Yeah. What was the intention? Did they come at it in an unusual way? Did I like it or not? That's sort of almost secondary. First, you have to go through that exercise. It just does, it, right. It just does not matter to me if you like the play or the yeah. person. It just matters whether or not you're able to, to uh, evaluate it. So yeah, absolutely. And the way to do that when you can't figure out how to do that is to ask yourself questions. Um, but I, I like, it was coming to me when everybody was talking about, because, you know, I loved Ride the Cyclone. That was great. <laughs> I had no idea that it, that it was a rented set and all that. I'm not a judge. It doesn't matter that I didn't know that. Um, but it does, it does sort of bring up to me that, you know, I, I have similar responses to black box theaters that have one thing on the set. So sometimes it's about the creativity that goes into a product, not the budget. And I think most people who like theater do have an emotional response, good, bad, or ugly about the creativity that goes into a piece. It just, to me, it feels like the critical response method that you've been trying to introduce to us tonight is really good at helping us tap into that because it's constantly asking how to the choices. How to, exactly. Serve exactly. The piece. Anyway, thank you for that. I just wanted to. And, I, and I'd like to say, uh, to add to what you're talking about in regards to the diverse, uh, the diversity of the judging committee and the diversity of the evaluators that are out there. This goes back to theater basics. Good casting is everything, right? And so if you've got a diverse uh, group of evaluators, diverse in, in, in life and diverse in uh, backgrounds and then diverse in um, taste, it kind of works itself out, but then that means it starts from here. So good casting is everything. Sometimes directors are really crappy and they just cast it really well. Um, Kate, thank you ladies and gentlemen for letting me talk this whole time. Thank you. Well, I wanted to, Suhaila, I don't know if it's convenient if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing your slides mm -hmm. from the critical response process so that everyone would have that Script of I, questions. I can send a, a PDF instead, and so that it can be distributed. Okay, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Oh, good. Uh, and um, if if everyone would, uh, because we don't get to hear it right now because we can't all be in the same room, would everyone help me uh, applaud Suhaila and thank her for her work? Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo! Hey, Suhaila, I'm muted. I know. Thank you. Thanks for thank being you on. for your time on this. Of course. And then also, please let us thank Brenda because Brenda champions all of our Ooh, salons, okay. all of our roundtables. But not without the help of you guys. So thank you, Kate and, thank you. and Suhaila. And I wanted to say, so since we are in this strange time of no productions. Um, we're trying to sort of make, um, take advantage of the fact that we can do some additional salons. So when, when we would normally have maybe one a quarter or two a quarter, we're, we're really kind of amping it up right now because we feel like it's, it's kind of okay to ask this of your time because um, we're not going to see plays. At the same time, we hope that it's interesting and useful and, and enjoyable for you as well. So we have our next two salons are scheduled. They'll be um, Sunday, March 7th. And that'll be uh, Freddie Ashley, Artistic Director of Actors Express. And Freddie has been teaching a class on aesthetic perspectives. Um, and we've been talking to him about sharing this uh, with us for a little while, but again, it's another, it's another approach. It's another way 
of checking your unconscious bias in certain aesthetics um, and how to just keep asking yourselves questions about what am I seeing and what do I feel about it and why am I feeling that? And this is actually, uh, um, if you're curious to know more about it and, and we'll of course have this with the materials, but it's from a, a program called Animating Democracy. So Freddie will be talking to us about that. And then on Sunday, April 11th, uh, Brenda Porter and our board chair, Sheree Caldwell, and Dr. Angela Farshiller, Tom Jones, and Gary Yates are coming back. We had a stellar um, conversation last October. It was theater from a Black perspective. And Brenda, we went how late? It, it went because it was so good and everybody stayed and we decided we must have part two. So there will be part two of that conversation. And uh, since you're here, I'll mention uh, then again, emails will come out about this, but since I have your, uh, your cap captive attention, uh, then on Monday, April 12th, uh, we will be having the first quarterly membership meeting because we've decided that we'll be doing those again. Right now, we're not competing with rehearsals. We're not competing with shows. So we'd like to have a few extra membership meetings and keep everybody informed. Um, so more info about that. Um, please, you know, you all are some of our best and longest term judges, evaluators. Please, I, I challenge you all to take this information and what you heard tonight and be sure to share it with your colleagues and be sure to um, share your impressions with the folks who weren't able to make the call tonight. The more that we're all able to discuss these ideas and grow from it, the better we are. What you want to do is go to your fellow judges or fellow evaluators and tell them the moments that resonate Gosh. and the questions that you had that came up for you in the evening. And then share your opinions if they want to hear them. <laughs> That's very good. It's, it's like, can I touch you? Yeah. <laughs> I have an opinion. I, do you want to hear it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and I, I did share the PDF in the chat but it is the wording that I use for my students in regards to evaluating developing work. You'll have to fill it in the way you want to in regards to how you evaluate a production. Um, and I hope that our discussion helped do that. This helped me because I just realized that this is probably more useful for raising teenagers than evaluating theater. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? My, my fiance is always like, I have an opinion about dinner. Would you like to hear it? I mean, <laughs> no. every, every conversation with a 19 year old ever. So thank, thank you. you. I just want to know you might have, you might, you might be developing better, a better mother. May I, um, as, as, ju as judges evaluators, um, I want you to know that I am open to hearing um, ideas of other salons and roundtables that you might like to explore during this time period. I can't promise you that we will do all of them, but I'm at least opening open to hearing what is it that you want to hear about and what is it that you want to learn. So feel free to send me an email. Well, I will uh, thank you guys, everybody, for your um, for everything. Thank you again, Suhaila. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have you. a great Thanks, night. Kate.